Welcome. Today I'm going to be discussing the proof of this particular conditional statement. The first thing that I've done is went through this textbook and selected a few definitions and theorems that I feel we'll need to use to prove this conditional statement. The tricky part about that is that you don't always know which theorems and definitions will apply when you're trying to prove a conditional statement. So I think the best thing to do is just kind of write down all of them that you think might apply, and then you just kind of play with what you have and try to apply those theorems and definitions and see what it gets, where it gets you, okay? So you might start with, you know, five or 10 definitions and theorems and then kind of condense it down and figure out and identify <coughs> which one of those works best. So let's start by talking and understanding, digesting this particular statement. Um, because before you prove a statement, you definitely want to understand what it's saying. Otherwise, you're going to be kind of uh, running around uh, without any bearings here. So, all right. So first, we have a hypothesis involving the divisibility of some integer m. So we're saying that um, we have integers um, n and m. We also know that it's always good to you know, understand what kind of variables you're dealing with. Make sure that you understand any restraints on your variables. So we know that n and m are greater than one, okay? And we know our hypothesis is that n divides m. Okay, and so that's why I started by picking out this definition because I thought, well, I want to try to, the reason that I picked this particular definition is um, I wanted a way to rewrite this relationship because I know that divisibility is related to this uh, modular congruence, but not necessarily in a direct, easy way. And so I thought maybe it'd be nice to have a way to rewrite this as an equation so I can manipulate that equation and try to end up with um, something involving this congruence mod m and n, right? Um, and then I thought, well, I definitely need to know about this congruence mod m and what it means. And it's kind of nice because I noticed that this congruence mod m actually talks about uh, divisibility. So, so that's kind of a nice little hint that, you know, we might get some uh, something from this hypothesis that we're looking for. Um, and then I thought that, again, just like with the definition of divisibility and how it allows me to rewrite that relationship as an equation, I thought, well, it'd be really nice if I could rewrite um, those modular congruences as equations. And I don't know if it's going to work, but that's just what I thought I would try, okay? Um, and of course, guys, remember, there's multiple ways to approach a proof, so um, always keep that in mind, please. All right, so let's, let's keep playing here. Like I said, I'm going to try to apply definition one. And again, this is just a sketch of my proof. No one should start a proof and, you know, start with their opening statement because when you're starting a proof, you have no idea where it's going to go. So you've got to start by taking notes, writing things down, trying to understand the um, statement and how your pieces of your proof are going to go together. We also have another hypothesis that A is congruent to B mod M. And we want to make sure we understand our variables. So remember, we're going to make sure we know that a and b are integers, okay? And there's no constraints on a and b at this time. So uh, we're within the statement, right? Okay, that looks a little bit better. So now I've got a hypothesis, I've got a conclusion, I've got some definitions and theorems I want to play with. So again, we're going to start, assume that our hypothesis is true, see where that gets there. So let's see. I know if n divides m, let's see what I know. Using this definition here, b is equal to ac if uh, a divides b, then I know that m must be some multiple of n because n divides m, okay? 
Um, and when I first thought about this definition of divisibility and rewriting it out as an equation, what I'd always do um, was go back and I would write an example. So I'd say, okay, I know 4 divides 3, or excuse me, <laughs> 4 divides 12, okay? So how do I rewrite 12? I write 12 as 3 times 4. So I know that I'm going to rewrite the second one as a multiple of the first one, okay? Um, so watch your variables, right? We don't want to use A or B or N here or M, right? That Those wouldn't make sense when we're trying to write out how M is a multiple of N. So I'm going to use C just like they did in the definition here. When you do that in your proof, you want to make sure that you declare that C is an integer, okay? So now I have this uh, relationship. So let's see where this gets us. Um, well, we can't really go anywhere with that right now, but let's let's see where else we can take this. Hmm. Okay, let's see what we know if m uh, a is congruent to b mod m. You know, I think I will use theorem four. Okay, I'm going to use theorem four to rewrite this um, modular congruence that's part of our hypothesis. So, <coughs> if a is congruent to b mod m just using this theorem here, theorem four, then I can rewrite this congruence. Okay, so let's see. Let's see what this gives us. A is congruent to B mod M. So that tells me that, uh, let's make sure I write it the right way. A, yeah, A is equal to B plus Again, watch your variables. I'll use k just like they did in that theorem. k times m, where k, well, is an integer, excuse me. All right, so now I have a little bit more of something to work with, because look, I can piece these two equations together, right? Because I've got an m here and an m here. So if I can mush those together, what do I get? Let's see. Okay, so, <clears throat> I'm going to take this equation, I'm going to substitute in this new representation for m, right? We're, we're trying to take what I know about m and what I know about a and b and mush them together to get something about n, right? And so I'm kind of looking ahead, thinking back to this statement here. So if I can write that a is equal to b plus some multiple of n, then I'll have my conclusion, right? So uh, let's see if we can do that. Now, I'm going to substitute in, instead of m, I'm going to write, uh, let's see, I had c times n, right, for m? Yeah, so instead of m, I'm going to write c times n, okay? And then just using the associative law of multiplication of real numbers, I can start by multiplying this k and c together first, okay? And that's it. I've actually shown my conclusion here by applying theorem 4, right? Because kc is an integer, right? So that gives me what I want, right? a is b plus some multiple of n. So I know that from here I conclude that a is congruent to b mod n, right? Because even though, though I take two integers here to get to that multiple of n, it's still an integer, so we're good to apply that theorem. Okay, so maybe let's take one more walkthrough of it when we actually write out this whole proof here, okay? So I'm gonna, again, this was just all scratch work to try to piece together the proof. Now I'm gonna go through and write up the actual proof. So let's do that. So I'm gonna declare to the reader that I'm starting a proof. I'm gonna go ahead and start by um, defining my variables and uh, I'll start there. So I'm going to say let m, n, a, b, b integers, okay? Where m and n are greater than 1. And we just need that to start talking about that uh, mod mod m, mod n needs to be greater than 1. Okay, um, let's see what else we know. Yeah, so that's that 
covers our variables that we're going to be dealing with. So let's start with our assumption. We're going to start by assuming our hypothesis is true. And again, remember, our hypothesis had two pieces. We were assuming that n is congruent, or excuse me, n divides m, and we're assuming that a is congruent to b mod m. So let's just be clear that those are our uh, starting assumptions of our proof. So we're going to say assume n divides m and assume that a is congruent to b mod m. So just rewriting our hypothesis, saying that we're going to assume that they're true. All right, so now let's break down and rewrite each of those pieces of our assumption um, as an equation. Okay, so by definition of divisibility, if n divides m, then m is equal to c times n for some integer c. Okay, so that's our first piece of our uh, puzzle here. Okay. Um, then let's go ahead and rewrite that congruence using theorem 4. Again, Reference justify any uh, manipulations you're making so that your reader knows why those are valid changes, okay? By theorem four, um, and as long as you, you know, you're using a textbook reference, okay, so this is the textbook that we use, so I know what theorem four is. If you're looking at some other textbook, and you're trying to reference a, the a theorem there, you can't say theorem four, right? You should either rewrite the theorem um, or you know, make a little footnote uh, that you're referring to this particular statement when you say theorem whatever, okay? So make, make sure that your theorems and uh, justifications are clear. <coughs> if A is congruent to B mod M, then a is equal to b plus k times m for some integer k. All right, now we're going to combine them together, right? Now, substituting m equals cn, we have a equals b plus k times cn. Again, apply that associativity of our multiplication of real numbers, k times c times n. So A is equal to B plus some integer times N. Hence, by theorem 4, so now we're using theorem four in reverse, right? That theorem four, we gotta be careful. It was an if and only if, so it's okay for us to do this. If it was just a conditional statement, this would not be valid, right? But it's an if and only if, so we can take it in any direction. So by theorem four, A is congruent to B mod N. We are done. Hope that helps clarify some things. Again, doesn't always happen on the first go around. Got to keep playing with your definitions and seeing how you can rewrite things and manipulate things in a way that are uh, that gets you to that conclusion. <laughs>